Our presenter today is Violetta Elick. Violetta is the head of digital systems and collection services at Galter Health Sciences Library. She has experience with managing content creation and dissemination of print and digital resources and supporting scholars' online identity with researcher management systems. And applicable to today's webinar, she has a lot of experience with metadata projects that required crosswalks between MARC XML, Dublin Core, and other metadata schemes. So she brings a lot of knowledge to this topic. A few things to keep in mind for today's presentation. Today's webinar does not have interactive chat capabilities. So if you want to comment on today's presentation, you can use Twitter using the hashtag on the screen. We don't monitor that, so that'll be between the uh, attendees. So if you have questions or comments for Violetta, please type them into the question box on your screen, and those will be answered at the end of the presentation. If we don't get to all your questions, Violetta will answer them offline and will email the answers to everyone. This webinar is being recorded, and you'll receive an email with the links to the recording, the presentation slides, and an evaluation within two days. And now, here's Violetta. There will be a slight delay as we change speakers. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me OK? I am pleased to present this webinar on transforming MARC XML records using XSLT. As Felicity said, I'm the head of Digital Systems and Collection Services Department at Northwestern University Health Sciences Library. I work with a wide range of campus stakeholders to develop and implement programs that increase awareness about scholarly communication issues in the digital environment. I oversee the implementation of a new digital asset management system, collaborate with the Center for Data Science and Informatics on integration of various data stores on campus. The Digital Systems and Collection Services Department encompasses creation, development, and maintenance of the library's website, evaluation, and implementation of technologies that support the goals and mission of the library, acquisitions, collection development, cataloging, and electronic and print resources management in support of the library's goal to have a robust collection that serves the library's users. The LX Education Committee has asked me to talk to you how I got interested in exploring XSLT for metadata transformation, why do I think the catalogers are best positioned to work on this type of projects, and to demonstrate the power of XSLT. After our paper, Metadata Makeover, was published, the LX Education Committee approached us about the possibility to present a webinar. In this paper, we argue that catalogers have become fluent in information technology, including extensible markup language, XML, and various programming languages. The knowledge gained from learning information technology can be used to experiment with methods of transforming one metadata schema into another using various software solutions. This paper discusses the use of extensible style sheet language transformations, XSLT, for repurposing, editing, and reformatting metadata. The main point is that catalogers have the requisite skills for working with any metadata schema, and if they are excluded from metadata work, libraries are wasting a valuable human resource. We all know that being a cataloger requires more than knowledge of and understanding of MARC, the Library of Congress Descriptive Cataloging Manual, Library of Congress Subject Heading Manual, Library of Congress Classification, uh, Research Description and Access, and many more cataloging metadata rules and standards. Cataloging practices must embrace the opportunity to employ new schemas for resource description and how to reuse and repurpose existing metadata. 
In the current library ecosystem, catalogers must be willing to assume new responsibilities to enable information to be organized, repurposed and shared with patrons and other libraries to assure proper resource description and access. A large part of these new responsibilities are grounded in the importance and use of metadata to meet the needs of libraries, including creating interoperable data, repurposing data and building digital repositories. As already mentioned, catalogers have the fundamental skills to successfully work with and repurpose metadata. Catalogers also need to be working with semantic technologies and standards, such as RDF, web ontology language, in order to to prepare our, our catalogs for the link data environment. In our paper, we explain how catalogers with intermediate knowledge of HTML, CSS and XML can develop style sheets to transform or enhance XML documents. So, you will ask, why catalogers? <laughs> A literature review brought to our attention the survey conducted by MA in 2007, which revealed that the metadata qualifications and responsibilities require knowledge of MARC, as well as advanced knowledge of metadata crosswalks, and that knowledge of XML and the Open Archives Initiative were considered desirable. Analysis of cataloging position descriptions performed by Park, Lou, and Marion revealed that advances in technology have created a new realm of desired skills, qualifications, and responsibilities for catalogers. Of the required qualifications, computer skills appear in 32.1% of the posting. Metadata knowledge, including uh, Dublin Core, EAD, MODS, TI, VRA, appear in 23.5% of the posting. Web knowledge, including but not limited to World Wide Web, HTML, HGML, XML, in appearing 16.3% of the postings. We all know about Terry Reese's tool, MarkEdit, which is used by cataloging metadata services staff members in their everyday work and provides means for uh, editing metadata, XML crosswalking, and metadata harvesting via the Open Archive Initiative protocol for metadata harvesting. Then we have Tosaka, who in his article stressed the importance of metadata transformation to enable reuse due to the increasingly global, interdisciplinary environment where users must deal with metadata records from multiple databases with their individual data structures. So, who better to tackle all of this than catalogers? Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> Some recommendations that came up in our paper are that cataloging departments need to be proactive in creation and maintenance of non mark metadata and in the development of means for sharing the metadata. Catalogers need to participate in development and use of descriptive standards. Additionally, I recommend that catalogers need to participate in development of semantic web technologies and creation of semantic web compliant data. So, having said all that, the outline for today is to discuss the MARC data challenges the XML family of standards, particularly focusing on XML and XSLT, creating a metadata map that will help you uh, with the crosswalk, then metadata transformation and a little uh, demo using the Oxygen XML editor. I will share some helpful resources with you that can help you further explore uh, all of these topics. And we will wrap up with some question sessions at the end. So, the four categories of metadata problems identified many years by uh, Duche and Hillman are missing data, incorrect or erroneous data, confusing or inconsistent data, and ins insufficient data. I'm pretty sure all of this is still valid today and you no, that this is valid. <laughs> Challenges pointed out 
by some other researchers like Woodley and his collaborators state that common issues with migrating data include ambivalent matches, hybrid bibliographic records, uh, data mapping to multiple fields or combining into single fields during migration, orphan data parsed into incongruous fields, mixed standards in original data, marked data loss during the migration and flat structure versus hierarchical structure. Then we have St. Pierre and Laplan describe similar issues with metadata crosswalks, including reconciling metadata organization systems, choice of unanalogous processes during metadata standards creation, imprecise definitions or alternate naming choices that inhibit element-to-element -element mapping, information being lost or combined during mapping, and unharmonious hierarchical structure. XML is part of family of standards that cooperate to support the study and processing of texts. Schema languages used uh, for the formal modeling of document structure. Uh, the most common schema langu languages used in XML world are DTDs, document type definitions, RELAX NG and W3C schema. Uh, XSLT is, of course, the extensible style sheet language transformation, a programming language used to transform XML to other format. So you can transform it to another XML document, to an HTML, or a plain text, or, and many more formats. The term style sheet is somewhat misleading. XSLT can be used to style an XML document, but it can also be used to create entirely new documents by transforming existing ones in almost unlimited ways. XQuery is a language used to query XML databases. XPath, a formal method of navigating the XML hierarchy used by XSLT and XQuery. XSLF4 is uh, used with XSLT to transform XML into PDF documents portable document format. SVG is a scalable vector graphic. It's an XML vocabulary or schema, if you will, for describing graphics. Useful in digital humanities projects, for example, for creating graphic representations of textual data. I've seen some digital humanists do this, uh, for example, if uh, to transform a play into a bar graph, illustrating how much each character speaks. You can see amazing things done with XSLT, actually. Uh, namespaces, uh, it's a technology used to manage different XML vocabularies in the same project. Schematron, a constraint modeling language used to restrict what is permitted in a document in ways that schema languages alone cannot address. Xproc is a pipelining language intended to allow the user to transform one XML document into another and actually doing it in kind of stages, feeding. Uh, piping the output of one transformation into the next as an input. Regular expressions, I'm pretty sure all of you are familiar with this. It's a symbolic system for representing text with wildcards or in any other flexible ways. Xforms is an XML-oriented replacement for the forms used on the web, on commercial sites and elsewhere. But uh, we will uh, focus today only on XML and XSLT. And according to Dr. David Birnbaum, a great teacher and a mentor, who I will quote actually quite a bit today, uh, he was my collaborator on a tutorial we did together on one conf during one conference. He says that XML is a formal model that is based on an order hierarchy or in a technical informatics term, uh, terms, a tree. It consists of a root, which contains everything else. The components under the root, which contain their own subcomponents. These components and subcomponents are called nodes. So he also points out why scholars represent their documents in XML. And there are basically two main reasons. XML is a formal model designed to represent an order hierarchy. And to the extent that human documents are logically ordered and hierarchical, they can be formalized and represented easily as XML documents. 
computers can operate very quickly and efficiently on trees. I mean, again, order hierarchies. And they operate much more quickly and efficiently than they can on non-hierarchical text, which actually makes sense. This means that if we can model the documents we need to study as trees, we can manage and manipulate large amounts of data efficiently. And uh, we will see how that can be done later on. Uh, Well-informedness, it's uh, very important in an XML document. Uh, root element, matching tags, no overlapping elements, quoted attribute values, proper name characters, no reserve characters uh, like ampersand angle brackets. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what this document analysis, elements and attributes, descriptive versus presentational markup, validity versus well-formedness. So let's start with um, order hierarchy so we can get a better understanding of what we mean by XML is a hierarchical tree. Internally, it is a hierarchy of elements, which means that each element, star tag, contents, and end tag, must nest fully inside other elements. The only exception is the root, which is the outmost element that contains the entire rest of the document logically cannot nest within any other element. Tags are not toggle switches that turn properties on and off. Tags are the way elements are serialized by inserting angle brackets and other text into data content. But XML is really a hierarchy of elements and the tags are just a way of representing that hierarchy in a linear fashion. When you open an element, you need to close it. And when you open it in a particular content context, actually, for example, inside another element, you need to close it before you can leave that context. This is very important to remember. Advice for Dr. Birnbaum, when you are writing XML, insert the whole element with both start and end tags at the same time. And actually, a good XML editor like Oxygen will do that for you. <laughs> and then back up and fill in the content. This will ensure that you think in terms of nesting elements inside other elements and not in terms of tags. If you use an XML editor, like I mentioned, Oxygen, it lets you select the text you want to mark up and wrap it in start and end tags, inserting both, simu both simultaneously. This will help you think of the element hierarchy instead of thinking about the start and end tags separately. So, what does it mean, uh, well-formed and the rules? So, basically, this is it, what you see on the screen. Every star tag must have a closing tag. Tags must nest cleanly, like you see in this case. Attribute values must appear within quotation marks. Uh, I have an example on the screen, like the page number 12, but in our we can talk about uh, tag uh, 245 that has to be in quotation marks when all the indicators, uh, indicator 1 or indicator 2, the values need to be in quotation marks. Tags are uh, case sensitive and they must match. So if you use lowercase, then you better use lowercase for the start and for the end tag. Otherwise, that's not well formed XML. Uh, it has to have one single root element, of course. The left angle bracket and ampersand are special characters. To the XML parser, the ampersand indicates that what follows is an entity that needs to be parsed into some other piece of data. Other characters, um, character references are ampersand, uh, greater than, less than, apostrophe, and quote, yes, and the quotation. Document analysis. Every project actually starts with document analysis and also includes schema design, markup, and processing. XML may look like a sequence of characters, some of which are data content and some of which are markup, but structurally it is a tree. 
and the stream of characters with markup and data content mixed together is just the way it is presented to the humans for reading. This representation of the XML tree as a stream of character, characters is called a serialization. A star tag is delimited by angle brackets and an end tag looks like a star tag except that it has a forward slash after the opening angle bracket. The name of the element is technically called a generic identifier. An element consists of the star tag, end tag and everything in between which may be other elements uh, or plain text or a mixture of the two. XML elements may have four types of content. Element content uh, which means an element may contain only other elements, a text content uh, which contains plain text of, uh, clearly, mixed content, uh, an element may contain a mixture of plain text and other elements, an element may have no content in which case it's an empty element. Empty elements may be used to mark moments in a document that have no associated text. Descriptive versus presentational markup. Descriptive markup is actually based on the idea that the best way to represent a document digitally is by describing it, not by giving instructions to a particular system on what to do with it by saying what each of its part is, parts is. It is designed to support an open class of applications like information retrieval, which is something we are interested in. Presentational markup is designed for reading as it clarifies the presentation of a document. Validity is a technical term that means that the document uses only certain elements and that it uses them only in certain context and you can write a set of rules determining where the various elements can and cannot occur and which ones can or cannot be repeated. This set of rules is called a schema and XML provides several language schemas that are capable of formalizing a document grammar. Again, I will quote Dr. Birnbaum, an XML document that is well formed can be validated against a schema to determine whether it follows the rules and this is commonly done during authoring and markup to ensure that one has used the elements and attributes in a consistent way. It is possible for a document to be well formed but invalid, but it is not possible for a document to be valid but not well formed since if it isn't well formed it actually isn't an XML document and therefore cannot logically be a valid XML document. So let's move now to XSLT and review some of the uh, facts about it. Uh, XSLT is one way to transform your document, manipulate the tree and output the results as XML, HTML, SVG or plain text. As Dr. Birnbaum states, you might use XSLT to generate project pages for display on your site, to generate intermediary pages for analysis and development, or to fit pieces of your data into another format for analysis with another tool, one that requires data in a particular format that is different from your main XML structure. These are very complex projects, by the way. Since XSLT is XML aware, it uses XPath to navigate and manipulate your document, which means that when you use XSLT to implement a transformation, you automatically use XPath within XSLT to find the pieces you want to transform and to manipulate the data. For Mark XML records, the XPath is, let's say for example, collection, record data field if we are looking into getting the data out of data fields but if we are looking into getting the data out of the, out of the leader the expat would be collection record leader we will see that in a oxygen editor later on an xslt style sheet is an xml document that must be valid against the xslt schema the root element is um, xsl style sheet and the elements inside the root are primarily uh, template 
elements. These template elements typically have a match attribute that matches the expat pattern and instructs the computer to use that template to process all matching nodes. I'm pretty sure this all sounds very intimidating, but believe me it's not. I'll show you in the Oxygen uh, XML editor. Uh, and finally, XSLT is a declarative programming language, which means that part of the way it works is that the templates don't get applied from top to bottom. What happens instead is that the program execution passes from template to template because an XSL apply templates element inside a template rule tells the system what to process next. Important to know is the namespaces. We have input and output namespaces. If we know that we are dealing with an XML document that is in a namespace, like we will deal with a Mark XML, which is in the Mark 21 uh, namespace, we need to tell that to our style sheet in order to process it with XSLT. To do this, we need to add an expat default namespace attribute to the root XSL stylesheet element and set its value to the value of the namespace declaration from the input XML file. Uh, the output namespace, the expat default namespace attribute specifies the namespace of the input XML. If your output is going to be in a namespace, for example, if you are outputting a Dublin Core, uh, XML record, it has to be, that needs to be defined in your output namespace. I mean, it has to be specified in the output namespace. You can control the output with the XSL output element. Uh, with that, you are actually controlling the type and formatting uh, so, if you want to get an XML file, you need to specify that, like it, said, it says here in the first line. If you want to get a text output, you're going to specify that in your XSL output uh, element. And XSL output is actually a top-level element, which means it must be a child of the root XSL stylesheet element, making it a sibling to all your template rules which are also top-level elements. XSL output is usually placed at the top of the document as a first child of the root XSL stylesheet element because that makes it easier for humans to find. But as long as it is a child, not a grandchild or any other descendants of the root element, your document will be valid. Another, another tip from Dr. Birnbaum, officially XSL output is, is an optional element which means that if it's omitted, you will not get an error message. And the system will try to guess what were you trying to output, what kind of format you were trying to output. But this leads to errors, so that's why it's best if you specify that. And at minimum, XSL output should have a method and indent attributes, like mentioned on the slide here. So, Library of Congress has done a good job for us uh, and developed the Mark XML architecture and Mark XML toolkit to standardize the exchange of Mark structured data in XML. Since you're going to get the slides, uh, if you don't know this already and the place of this uh, uh, site, you can find it on this slide under standards hyperlink. So. Mapping uh, compares and analyzes two or more metadata schemas, while crosswalks are the products of the mapping process. Each SSLT stylesheet describes how a set of XML documents, the source documents, should be converted to other documents, the result documents. A major difference between MARC and XML is that XML uses brackets to denote the beginning tag and ending tags. The tags need to be predefined in a data format definition structure. XML is hierarchical, as are MARC tags and subfields. However, 
XML is potentially more hierarchical as there is no limit to the number of levels, unlike MARC, which is limited in number of by the established standard. There are two opposing views on crosswalks. Some researchers have pointed them out and they say that uh, crosswalks are a stopgap measure, a local and temporary solution until a single data standard is developed. I personally don't believe in this. The other view asserts that crosswalks represent an attempt to identify interoperable elements among standards. This implies that crosswalks should become a standard practice. So since today I will demonstrate how to transform Mark XML records into Dublin Core, let's review the 15 base Dublin Core elements. As you can see, uh, title, creator, subject, description, publisher, contributor, date, type, format, and so on. Helpful for your uh, transformation from one schema to another, more specifically from Mark XML to Dublin Core, is to create a metadata map, like a simple table or a cheat sheet. And I'm pretty sure this is the same across the institution since we will always map 245 to DC title, right? Uh, title alternative can come from few other fields, as you can see on this map. Uh, creator and contributor can come from 1xx or 7xx fields, and if we want to qualify them even further, we as catalogers know how to do that, since we know what goes, for example, in delimiter E, and if that value is thesis advisor, for example, we will qualify the DC element to reflect that. So we will have a DC contributor dot uh, thesis advisor or uh, and some other examples. If you have a illustrator, if you have a, any other type of contributor, you can qualify them further. But you as catalogers know what to do with this kind of data that comes from MARC records. Someone not familiar with MARC will have trouble with this. Uh, same is actually true for DC description elements. Since as catalogers, we know that if we have 505 we, uh, field, we can map that to DC description table of contents. Or if we have 520, we map that to DC description abstract. For all of you catalogers out there, this map is sufficient as a starting point, and you will know what to do with all of these data fields, control fields, and values from the leader, and you will know how to map them. Another example uh, where I don't need to tell you how to further qualify uh, some elements is the identifier element. Uh, so, if you see a O20, you will know that you need to qualify it to identifier.isbn. If you see O22, you will qualify that as identifier ISSN. Uh, or now we have this uh, O24 fields where you ca we can uh, add additional information and we can qualify even further and have more richer metadata extracted. So, how we actually get MARC XML? Uh, records to work with in the first place. Uh, you can get them actually directly from OCLC. You can get them via Mark Edit workflow. Uh, you will basically export it from OCLC the, set, the usual way and convert the Mark XML via Mark Edit. Or you can get export from your ILS if you have the admin privileges to do that. If not, then you're going to have to ask someone that does have those privileges to send the files to you. So, I will just show today how to get them directly from OCLC because I find that most useful and easy for me, so I don't bother anyone. Uh, once logged in OCLC under Tools and Options, you will select the export tab, of course. Uh, you can create a new export destination file because you don't want it stored in the same uh, file where your usual MARC records go. You want somewhere where you can store only the XML rec uh, format. 
Under Options window, select Record Characteristics and under Bibliographic Records section and Record Standard, select Mark XML. Under Character Set, you select UTF-8 Unicode. Sorry for this very specific <laughs> cheat sheets. <laughs> so, next, you, after you exported them, you select the uh, the record will be of course stored in the new export destination file you selected. Uh, then you can open your file in Oxygen XML editor or any other similar editor and you are ready to manipulate the XML file with XSLT. So just Take a look at this. I'm not sure how clearly this is. I wanted to fit the whole record on one screen, but we can look at it in an Oxygen XML editor. And let's say this is something we exported from OCLC. And now we would like to go live on Oxygen XML editor and try to transform this one record using, I hope this is okay and you can see. So this is the record, Future of Humanities. As you can see here in the beginning, the this is a MARC record, it's in the uh, MARC 21 SLIM uh, namespace and it's not a very robust and uh, rich with metadata record, but I, as I said, I wanted to fit it in uh, one whole screen so I don't have to scroll up and down. So, uh, we have enough fields to get us started, but I will share with you one style sheet that's going to be shared again, it's on my GitHub account, so you can uh, you can get it from there and start experimenting. As I mentioned, you can see here again all the namespaces defined, even the Dublin core element here, because we want to put that into out, our output document is going to be in Dublin core. And uh, you can see here that uh, MARC data fill 245 is mapped to DC title. These little things at the end, this means that I just want to get rid of the dot at the end, the uh, uh, punctuation, <laughs> or, you know, so you will figure all this out. So, and I want to get all the uh, data from subfields A, B, C, F, and you will, it will, this goes on. But you can limit that, of course. You can delete some of them and just don't cross that over into Dublin Core. Uh, 246 is uh, mapped to DC title alternative. Uh, 700 and 100 are mapped to uh, creator. Uh, 710 is mapped to contributor. And if you hover over, you will see uh, what does that mean when, uh, what are you telling here. So, let's start from the beginning. This match, uh, XSL template match, uh, is a declaration that defines the template, which contains a sequence constructor for creating nodes and or atomic values. And, uh, the slash here means it applies to the whole record. We want everything to be in uh, RDF. Then we're going to have a uh, few other uh, elements that we want to, like you can see here, defining the templates. I want to match the mark record. And you can read X Oxygen XML Editor is very useful for that. It gives you the definitions, it gives you uh, everything so you know what to do. I'm going to try to make this uh, bigger just 
so you can maybe see better. I hope this is okay. Maybe one more. Okay. I hope this is fine. And um, sorry, I, I just saw that they were asking me to make this larger. So we we are matching. This is uh, okay. Where is uh, I'm going to show you now? Where is the um, our attributes in the XML record. I'm going to make this bigger too in the Mark XML records. You can see here Oxygen gives you the three. The collection, then the record, the leader, control field, data field. Uh, they are all uh, siblings, leader, control field 01, 08, and data fields are all siblings, and then you have subfield, which is a child of data field. So it's very easy in a uh, good oxygen uh, editor uh, to understand what's happening with your XML tree. And here you basically see on this side, you basically see what elements you have and what you're working with and what you can map. So if you bring your metadata map here, you will be able to distinguish, okay, I'm going to map 245 to title, I'm going to map uh, 260 uh, delimiter C to date published, I'm going to map uh, 500 to uh, DC description, I'm going to map 700 to DC creator, I'm going to map 710 Dartmouth College and uh, Media Production Group and Dartmouth College Research Computing to DC contributors. So all of this is here in the style sheet. I have covered most of the fields and since they're on GitHub you can have it later, you can take it and uh, run with it and experiment. I have try to add even more than we original fields uh, than originally present. So now let's try to convert this document using this style sheet. I'm going to say create configure transformation scenario. You can see this little branch here, configure transformation scenario. So it's already configured, but I'm going to create a new it's a new XML transformation with XSLT. I'm going to call it um, Webinar 1. This is going to be the first one we're going to do. And here you see in XSL URL, you will see all the open XSLTs that I have in my Oxygen Editor, and you're going to select it. If you don't see it and nothing is open in your Exigen Editor, you're going to browse and find it in your local file. I usually use the transformer Saxon HE. Uh, that's a recommendation I got from my teacher, Dr. Birnbaum. Output, we want to open it in editor after we are done. Uh, of course, the results are going to be in XML because that's what we put like output, it's going to be an XML document. And then we want to save it as, let's say, uh, Future of Humanities DC, Dublin Core. And we're going to, since it already exists in my folder, I'm just going to replace it. And okay, so now we have the scenario configure, it's webinar one. And then all we need to do now is click Apply Associated. And it opens it up. No errors. As you can see, the green thing here. I'm going to make this bigger so you can see better. So this is what we got from the first. So if you are happy with what you got, this is going to be your Dublin Core 
uh, metadata. If you're not happy, you can still continue parsing and extracting data from other fields, combining and adding them and mapping them to whatever you want. So that's one example. Now let's, uh, I promise I'm going to show you another and that's all, that uh, style sheet is also available on GitHub, but I wanted to show you what that, that thing does, creating a top separated value output. Uh, I created it as a top delimited rather than comma delimited output file to guard against the possibility that there might already be a comma in one of the fields. And this is the style sheet I'm talking about. I'm going to make it bigger also. This was very useful. This is a simple style sheet I developed for data quality control when we were working on HathiTrust projects and we needed to make sure we have all the BIB records, all the 035, uh, 830 uh, series statements and all that. So um, uh, Excel uh, can import the top delimited uh, files as you are all aware, so that's why the uh, output is going to be uh, text, as you see here. Method output is text, and I'm going to open it later in a uh, spreadsheet. Document that I'm going to run this style sheet against is this one. As you can see here, this is a big uh, XML, mark XML record, and let's see how many we have. Uh, mark records. I'm just trying to find this so we know how many we're going to get at the end. So we have 219 matches. Okay. And now let's run the transformation. Let's see if this recognizes it. It does recognize. But I'm going to create, I'm going to configure it again. So, new XML transformation with XSLT. With the tab XSL style sheet, the transformer is going to be again that. The output is not going to be XML. I'm going to save it as um, uh, tab file txt. So remember, that's okay. And then apply. Nothing's opening here because I didn't tell it to open, but we're going to open it with a spreadsheet open, oh, sorry, um, I named it tab file. So it's a delimited, it's tab separated, and let's just make all of this general, that's fine, and let's finish up. So. Uh, I'm not sure you can see all of this, but you see what I mean. So we have how many records that we were trying to run and uh, get 219. So we did get 219, and as you can see here from 830 field, the third column, we are getting some inconsistencies in enumeration. Some are using the number, some are not using the number, and that's then that quality control of the mark records that then you can go back and fix all of this. So um, let's go back to the presentation. Resources, uh, 
are here. You can look at them when you get the slides. Uh, this is what I recommend. Then some resources uh, that are XSLT related. Uh, you have some online uh, very interesting function XSLT library. Uh, they post on XSLT FAQ page. Uh, two books that were really, really, really helpful to me, especially the Michael Case XSLT 2.0. Uh, files, these uh, two or three uh, uh, transformation scenarios, uh, two or three XSLTs are on my Git account and you can get it from there. And in conclusion, I just uh, wanted to make sure that I stress again that how catalogers have the potential to undertake metadata projects by active participation in the transformation of metadata from one schema to another. I wouldn't conclude before I thank my teachers and mentors, especially Dr. David Birnbaum, who is the chair of the Slavic Languages and Literature Department from University of Pittsburgh, Dr. Laura Mandel, the director of initiatives for digital humanities, media and culture, professor at the Department of English, Texas A&M University, and Matthew Gibson, who is the director of digital initiatives, uh, editor of Encyclopedia Virginia, Virginia Foundation for the Humanities, and Christine Rutuolo, digital services manager for humanities and social sciences and bibliographer for English language and literature at the University of Virginia Library. And uh, with that, I would like to conclude and maybe take some questions now. I hope we do have time. Violetta, that was amazing. I think it's going to make a lot more sense to me after I watch this recording three more times. So just <laughs> to remind everyone that you will be getting the recording and the slides. So um, let me just quick. So I guess what it was the whole thing was intimidating, but it's pretty basic it seems. I'm going to get my Mark XML record. The styles, the XSLT style sheets are available. Like you found one, right? Or right, we use yours. Yes, you can so use we them choose our data. style sheet, we mm -hmm. choose our output, mm -hmm. and we have our new record. Yes, yes. Great. If you are transforming from Mark XML to Dublin Core or to Mods, you would want to have the output as XML. But if you are running different kind of projects, like the ones I was doing, like for quality control, to check if we have everything, all the information in those fields, like I show with the tab separated uh, output. Uh, you will have your output as text. And uh, there are many more complicated uh, projects that you can tackle with XSLT, uh, but there was not basically time, and that's probably more advanced uh, webinar uh, maybe okay. at some other time, that you basically have three or four documents pointing at each other, and you can basically work into getting uh, into your Mark record, Mark XML record, uh, injecting fields and values in, uh, uh, let's say, for, especially for Hatip tr Trust project, we had to add 955 fields with local identifiers and enumeration. So all of that is done with XSLT, but mm. you combine three basically, or four documents that work at the same time and you project and you have one document as an output. Okay. It's really powerful. <laughs> okay, so we have our, some questions here. Are there good free XML editors available? Uh, I have to say this Oxygen XML editor individual license cost me $65 four years ago when I got it. And a renewal license is 21, so I have not worked with anything else than Oxygen. But I'm pretty sure you can find. I've used uh, some uh, Oxygen Grid, I think. Um, and I'm sure you can find some that are available. Maybe I should have looked into that. See, I forgot. Mm -hmm. And I recall that Oxygen has a discount for educational institutions. Yes, yes. So here does. we got we got a, a license that allows us to put it on as many computers as we want, but one user yes. at a time. Yeah. Yes. Okay. 
Is Mark Edit similar to Oxygen, or do they serve different purposes? Um, Mark Edit is actually a very good tool, and I've used it um, many, many, many times for many projects. Um, but what I liked about XSLT is just being able to see what I'm doing and see immediately if that thing works or doesn't work. Because as you remember, the, on the Oxygen XML editor, it tells you immediately if your file is valid. It gives you a green box or a red box if something is wrong. It tells you immediately what you have uh, messed up. And it's probably a matter of preference. Mark Edit has uh, XSLTs built in, so you can transform the data uh, via Mark Edit too, of course. You don't okay. need to use XSLT. Great. You mentioned that you have your files on Git, GitHub. Mm -hmm. For people who don't aren't familiar with that, can you just... Oh, they can one? just... Let me just... Oh, maybe I'm not presenter anymore. Yes. Uh, um, this is the Git account, okay. and if you, they go on this website, they can just, uh, when they find the website, they can click on each of those style sheets, and if they don't know how to pull, fork, whatever, they can just get the raw data. That won't give me any credits, of course, uh, attribution, <laughs> contribution, but who cares, right? And uh, they can get the raw data, the okay. file from there, and just use it. Okay, great. Do you have um, style sheets that transform from Crosswalk non-MARC XML to MARC XML? Non-MARC XML to MARC XML? Yeah, from Dublin Core to mm -hmm. MARC uh, XML. Yes, I do have those, even though that was not uh, uh, very much used. So I didn't put that on Git, but I can probably find it and add it there. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, where where do you use the outputted files? Can you provide some examples of how you use your results? Uh, out, you mean the outputted uh, Dublin Core XML file? Right, right there, yeah. You know, your it results goes are. into the uh, metadata that goes to the digital repository. Okay. So you're taking your MARC record turning it into Dublin Core and adding it to your repository. Yes, because okay. uh, in the repository we uh, can use the Mark XML or, you know, we were just, uh, and now here at my new institution I won't use Dublin Core. It's going to be much more complicated than that, but again I'm going to have to use style sheets for that too, even though some people uh, are intimidated by them, mm -hmm. but style sheets are really powerful and you can transform um, uh, Dublin Core or MODs or Mark XML records into semantic web compliant data mm -hmm. and uh, just you use the proper vocabularies and schemas and you will be able to populate your uh, digital asset management system, wherever it is. Great. Okay, we have time for one more question. So, you mentioned uh, the Library of Congress has some transformation. You have some on your site. Are, do you know of other sites or places people might get um, the style sheets, like the example of past perfect output uh, files? Uh, I'm guessing just if they I'm pretty sure many people have their uh, things uh, on Git, mm -hmm. so maybe searching the Git repository or just searching for your uh, specific example, like some keywords, You, I'm pretty sure you can find those. So I, uh, that's the starting point, the Library of Congress, uh, the MARC XML architecture, uh, they have provided uh, transformation to Mark, uh, from Mark to Dublin Core, from Mark to Mods, and then you have again the uh, uh, sites where you have the transformation to uh, EAD, to VRA, and 
all this other, but I have never worked with EAD on VRA, so I just not familiar with that. Okay. Well, thank you. Well, thank you for uh, giving this us this introduction to Mark XML and XSLT and uh, the demo. That's really useful. So to everyone, I you. trust you found today's session useful. So you will soon be getting a short online evaluation form. The Continuing Education Committee uses this to plan future events. So please do fill that out. We have some other events coming up. So we have a series on working with continuing resources with three more webinars coming up in March, providing perpetual access in April, another one, tech services, a uh, technical kind of one, using LibGuides. And then we have our Preservation Week webinars, plus more. So the URL is at the top of that screen, so please check that out. We also have web courses. So the web courses are four to six weeks, and they're more in-depth training on specific topics. And our two-day e-forums are still being scheduled. So a special thanks to you, Violetta, for sharing that knowledge. Also to Joseph Nicholson and Emily Whitmore. They helped with the tech support today. Without their help, we couldn't put on these webinars. I really appreciate that. Thank you all for joining us, and we hope you'll participate in other ELECTS continuing education events in the future.